This is episode three, and the topic tonight is pests. Warm it all up. Everything you've got. Come on, you hey. You want to live forever? like to first as always go around and see how everybody's doing this week and hopefully you guys don't have no pests in the garden how you doing red setter farms i'm doing great tonight how's everybody doing i am red setter farm you can find me on instagram and anywhere cannabis stuff is available platforms uh let's see youtube and i'm michigan bros grow show 9 p.m i'm ready to talk about pests i hate pests they happen to all of us we all battle them all the time and I'm really glad you guys are coming on here to share because it's something that a lot of growers that definitely uh, growers that are on IG like us or YouTube, they don't show those problems half the, or majority of the time. But uh, Spartan Ground, how you doing tonight? Doing good. Sitting here getting high in my own supply, my favorite thing to do, man. But uh, yeah, you can find me on Spartan Grow on Instagram or right here on YouTube, Michigan Bros Grow Show. I'll make it short today. M2, the Michigan Medicated. How are you doing tonight? I am Michigan, Michigan Medicated. Um, you can find me on Instagram. And I'm doing really good. So is uh, anybody here currently battling any pests right now? I had some fungus gnats earlier in the uh, tent, but... Uh, <laughs> I kind of figured it comes with the territory when you're throwing everything back into the soil and you're reusing it. So uh, yeah. I just um, put some sticky traps down right now to just see how many I catch. And if there's going to be a lot, I'll just probably use some DB. Mm -hmm. But uh, usually fungus nest isn't a huge problem for me in there so much because uh, it's just a veg tent anyway. And fungus nests don't really, as long as you let the top of the media dry out, they usually go away. Yeah, and I mean, that's perfect because that's actually the first uh, pest that I wanted to get into. Uh, fungus gnats are basically a fruit fly. You know, they're, you find them in a lot of indoor house plants. They're attracted to moisture in pot, of the potting soil. You know, you keep your topsoil wet all the time, you're going to get damn fungus gnats in the majority of uh, growing media. I think they'll even go into inert media. Like if you're just doing a rock roll cube and it's too moist all the time on the top, they get, they'll get in there. But I'm not positive on that one. But <clears throat> after three days, when uh, once the fungus gnat adult lays an egg, the egg will hatch into a larvae, which will uh, burrow into the soil and feed on, feed on fungi and decaying material, which isn't a bad thing in small populations. It's when they start to get uh, to a huge amount, they'll run out of dead stuff to eat and they'll start working on your plant's roots. And though they're vectors for disease. I mean, they can, as much as, people, as much as people push off fungus gnats, they can cause a lot of secondary issues. So you really should try to control them and get them out of your garden. Uh, Fungus gnats are completely harmless to humans since they can't bite us and they don't spread a disease. Uh, they can be a problem for house plants, but however, when the population explodes, their larvae just like they will. All all your brand new new root tips is basically what they're going to go after, and they're going to gnaw on them, and you're going to it's going to stunt growth. It's you can get into a lot of pro you can get into a lot of issues if you have way too many gnats. And my favorite way of beating them is uh, 
basically physical treatments like locking off the top of the soil, letting stuff dry out, using high wind, having sticky traps. Like it, it's it's cool if you can throw some predators and nematodes in there to help you out. But I've found that those are just the best way to do it. Like, you don't want these guys around. If you have, say, like an arrow cloner and stuff like that, fungus gnats can uh, crawl around uh, and do little bites and cause uh, pythium, which will cause a, a lot of your, uh, we'll call it a lot of dampen dampening off in your roots or ch your clones. Sorry, I'm a little tongue tied right now. But yeah, guys, take them seriously. Don't let them get out of control in your garden. Now, when you're talking about the physical ways to get rid of fungus nests you're you're covering the top soil is what you're saying but what's important there a lot of people will use sand some people try to landscaping fabric things like that but a lot of people use sand because that actually fucks them up when the larva are coming out of the soil they got to crawl up through that sand and that sand is like glass to them when they go through there so it'll fuck them up but it's important that like if you're using Air pots wouldn't, or um, smart pots, it wouldn't be a problem, like a fabric pot or, a, you know, easy swap pot, for example, wouldn't be a problem. That would be all you'd have to do. But if you have like your standard plastic pot and it has the little holes on the bottom, make sure that if you're, um, when you do your trans, I would transplant out of that and go into another pot so that you could cover those holes with landscaping fabric on the inside because the little fuckers will just crawl at those holes. If you cover the top. And yeah, all those holes in plastic pots are great entrance ways. <laughs> yeah, and the same thing with air pots. There's holes everywhere. So and usually wet entrance ways also. It's a good yeah. breeding environment. So with like the sand method, since we know uh, fungus gnats only live a few inches down in the topsoil, uh, do you recommend like digging out a few inches and then putting your sand in or just throw the sand on top of there? Dude, you could I bottom would. dress your pots with a little bit of sand. I don't see why not. I mean, you just I've used pebbles and things like that in my outdoor, like when I do outdoor potted plants and stuff, I always use some type of a rock foundation on the bottom to keep it aerated so that there's no um, anaerobic runoff down there. You, I don't think you'd have to um, dig. You could just put right on top. And my reasoning for that is, is that they still, if you put it right on top, they still got to go through it. Why disturb the soil and possibly fuck up some microbes when you can just fucking cover them? You know, cover up is fucking... Now, it's going to be a pain in the dick to kind of water with the sand on top. It does kind of suck a little bit. But, uh, you know, there's better ways, too. Like, for me, that's what I originally did. But it got to be such a pain in my ass to deal with the sand that uh, then I just took different measures, like nematodes. Nematodes, of all the things... Predators, uh, BB, Bovaria, Bossiana, um, for control of fungus gnats. I found that just the nematodes, for me, seem to work the damn best. See, what, you're, what it is, if you, have a, if you have a bunch of fungus gnats, you got something out of control in your environment. You know, your balance is off somewhere. So all you got to do is introduce some kind of a predator to fucking take out whatever's out of control and then... There's nothing for those predators to eat anymore and they die off. And then that kind of solves your problem. If you've solved the problem of how you got them originally, like how did I get them originally? Did they come out of a bag of soil? Did I get them from my buddy? Blah, blah, blah. Try to trace that back to the beginning problem to really solve your issue. If you keep getting a certain pest, the problem usually is the grower, you know, bringing it in somehow or off of clones or things like that or your environment's not sealed properly to keep the pest away, or I don't know, there's a million different things, but uh, yeah, try to, yes, control the problem, but at the same time, in the back of your head, try to figure out how the hell are these fucking things getting in here, and let's address that, and hopefully once we fight and win this battle, we're not coming back and doing this again in two or three weeks, you know what I mean? So that's where, like, uh, I mean, it all boils down to cost, and what you're willing to spend but uh even if it's a monthly treatment of nematodes like maybe maybe you only treat them one time with nematodes and veg and that's it um, it's still better than doing nothing at all as far as you know ipm goes madness 
This is Sparta! The, con the, con the two, like, I would say the two most common culprits for bringing in fungus gnats to people is, uh, would be your bag soil, of course, because I... Maybe things have changed, but the last time I checked, uh, no matter what soil it is, the majority of them all get shipped together. So if one company is, you know, just keeping tons of gnats in there and not treating them with predators, all the bags will get it. And another one is uh, worm castings. If you're not getting high quality worm castings, uh, there's a good chance that you're probably bringing in gnats from that. You can solve that problem by making your own worm, worm castings. But the other problem, you get, unless you can make your own soil and you have that capability, then uh, you just have to try to, I can recommend M3 mix. I'm using that right now. I don't get fungus gnats so much from that. The fungus gnats I'm dealing with came out of that Coco Loco. So uh, whatever. Coco Loco is far cheaper too though. So <laughs> yeah. I've used so many brands of cocoa over the years. I have no idea where they came from, but I've always just had a strict battle with like root it well what i now know is like root aphids and fungus gnats they come and go it seems like the seasons and stuff like that but so i'm doing a diligent just treatment with uh, nematodes sf specifically because they'll treat for not only fungus gnats but root aphids as well and i'm seeing a huge decrease in numbers just off two treatments two weeks worth um i'm gonna start doing that weekly and um you know just make it so that they they don't have a place to repopulate basically because there'll be nematodes in there eating larvae all the time. So I'm just going to keep applying them. The really cool thing about those nematodes is you can fucking like order a batch and then split it in half and put half in the fridge and you can keep those fuckers alive in the fridge and it slows them down long enough to where you can spread it out to two weekly treatments if you wanted to, you know, hit them with the half That's of it. That's what I did. Week. Yeah. So yeah, I split it into like six parts because, um, I treat so many different areas, you know, I'm treating different areas and then I'm treating multiple times off of the same batch. But I found that a, a, a one acre worth, I mean, 50 million nematodes goes a really long way, you know, so I'm, I'm checking the effectivity on that one and now I'll step it down a notch. And if I get a worse breakout by stepping it down to 30 million, you know, nematodes, then I'll know that I need to stick with the 50 million, but there's no like, what is uh overdose rate there's no minimum dose rate there's no maximum dose rate it's just you know control your populations with how much will work this amount will you know provide enough for an acre so i know how much to use out of my yard in the summertime when i got grubs because i don't want to spray anything so nematodes are great for that too outdoor garden i okay, always got little gnats I, i'm sure that the root aphids came in from outdoors that's probably a, i mean that's an easy one you know you open up your your curtain or something if you're growing in in your you know most row rooms or like in a bedroom or a basement or something there's access to you know you open your windows root aphids can fit in through those those curtain holes or the the screens very easily they can be really tiny as adults they can be large as adults also but they can be really tiny little gnats and they just come in and your garden those little suckers suck you'll think that they're fungus gnats for years and you'll be battling fungus gnats not knowing why they're not going away it's because you've been battling the wrong pest with the wrong with the wrong approach so you got to look for the two little tailpipes that are coming out the back. If it's a, it's a, um, if it's got a round body, single round body, and it's I uh, got two little tailpipes coming out the back, and it's got six little legs and walks like a little beetle, then you're dealing with root aphids. And if you have like these dual bodied, long, langular um, tail end, uh, you can almost clearly tell the difference. It almost looks more like a mosquito or something like that. That's a fungus gnat so definitely uh, try to stick them under a microscope if you can to identify what pest you're dealing with that's important yeah I'm glad, I'm glad you got experience on the the root on aphids in general because it's something I haven't dealt with so like the information that I have is just stuff that I've heard and seen on YouTube like uh, I've heard that they they can asexually reproduce I mean they are not yeah they'll clone themselves they'll just make exact copies of each other and there's also yeah, two they're... different types of aphids one will attack the root zone and one is uh, a, like a leaf aphid and then there's actually aphids that are specific to cannabis now too if I'm not mistaken 
I have had leaf aphids also, and they end up, it, it almost looks like, like a white fly infestation or something. It's real weird. It happens at the end of flower, like the last two weeks of flower while you're flushing and everything looks great. All of a sudden, you'll do a walk through the garden and you'll notice that three tops or just half of the top is just consumed with aphids. Um, I've beaten those with, I believe, uh, BB because I was treating with BB at the time. And then, um, you know, those have since I haven't really had an issue with that. It's been a couple of years since I've actually had an issue with, with the leaf aphids. Those suck. And then outdoors, um, I'll get the big giant green aphids which um, I'll, I'll treat with probably BB this summer, uh, pre-flower and stuff like that. And post-flower, I'm just going to uh, let it ride because they're usually down on the stems or somewhere you can like knock them off and they're not getting in the buds too bad. But they're, they're big aphids. You can see those. They're big and green and you can, pro you can shake your plant. And they'll... Now, if you get them so, all over your stem, you might have to do something different. So did you, were you able to beat aphids, the rice root aphid? with um with BB those, those i'm working on those i'm working on like as an ipm those are going to probably take forever to beat because uh how are you how are you treating those are you just doing nematodes. like a soil branch no i'm doing nematodes, nematodes because the bb will kill all the nematodes so effectively i need the nematodes right now because fungus gnats is always an issue so when i when i treat with bb it, i can't get rid of the fungus gnats with the bb so while the, while the fungus yeah so it's like a two you know it's like a catch 22 so the bb will like it's a great knockdown and it really wipes them out because you can soak your root zone in. i can put the bb right in my reservoir and just douse my plants with it and yeah it works great but the fungus gnats are like eh, i don't give a fuck about that whatever i'm just gonna keep repopulating so the fungus gnats will keep taking over and then you know you gotta wait however long you at least a couple of weeks and i'll wait a, a longer period of time because i want to ensure if i'm going to spend 50 bucks on a product it's going to work so i'll wait longer and you know the root aphids will come back and the gnats will keep repopulating while i'm you know so that's yeah. just, so i'm not even going to mess with anything else i'm just going to hit everything with nematodes from now on so you got one product to, to treat yeah. things that's yeah. cool and fortunately the sf version now there's three different types of nematodes there may be more predatories but the main three that i've seen from the company that i'm working with um off the top of my head uh, i i can't tell you but i'll maybe i'll jump on amazon here in a second i'll say the amazon one um, the, the super popular amazon one is nature's good guys nature's good guys yeah those were the guys that were um recommended by dank man dan on embracing organics i took his recommendation just because they were a little bit cheaper than a ag product they were slightly cheaper and i was going to just try them out if they didn't work then i was going to go back to the ag product but they seem to be working so i'm gonna his I've recommendations heard, yeah. be good yeah, I've had good luck with nematodes, and that's where I got them too. So I can second that and say they're pretty good for nematodes anyway. Actually, so what I'm ordered a ahead. bunch of uh, packets, or I said I think it's like ten packets, it's like five thousand uh, lace wings from them. If you wanted a couple of those to throw in there to uh, help with that, because they're the babies are actually named uh, aphid lions. Hmm. I'm getting them for like thrip and uh, spider mite you know, control, make sure there's nothing lingering around in my garden. Yeah. Because where they'll linger out is they'll walk around your trays when they're, when they're like nymphs and, and they're small, I'll just see them walking around my trays and I'll just sit there smushing them, you know, crushing them, getting rid of them. Cause I got white trays. You can clearly see what a moving piece of cocoa is, you know, it's, that's not cocoa. <laughs> so you, you kill it. Doesn't have, it doesn't have wings yet or anything. You can get it. You take them there and, you're able to like hit them with a piece of tape or something. If you don't crush them, then you can scope them easily and look for the tailpipes and say, oh shit, I have fucking root aphids. I probably had root aphids for six years. Yeah, you probably did. Um, you know, it's, it's likely that most, most gardens are going to encounter them. Like I said, they're probably most of our yards and shit. They're just a pain in the ass, but um, treat, I, I'm thinking treat with the nematodes. It's, it can be expensive. I think if, um, if you're constantly doing like, packs of 50 million so like i said i'm gonna try the 30 million see where i get with that but it'll last for a couple of weeks and then eventually they'll be gone and i'll be able to just well yeah the thing with bb and what i would recommend is yeah just kind of what you already said you were kind of doing it was just go with like the nuclear approach go with way more than you need at first just smash that bucket so you can knock them completely out yeah, a huge population and then, of them. and then just get small like whatever the smallest quantity is order that and then apply that maybe split that in half and keep storing the refrigerator and just uh 
try to stretch that as much as you can after that because then you only need a small population to be re reintroduced every once in a while until more shit shows up then maybe <laughs> order extra packs and just fucking nuke them again I think it seems it, like they can be bred inside like wax worms or something like that so there is a way to actually farm your own nematodes yeah you can farm your own nematodes but it smells terrible so, okay that's good to know so yes you can do it but don't do it in your house <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Uh, the only suggestion I really have is, you know, it obviously bit me in the butt because I was treating for fungus gnats for so long and probably for years. But, you know, definitely identify what you have. It's the only main advice that I can give. And then from there, treat with safe products, you know, try to treat with beneficials. If you can treat with bugs to kill bugs, you know, that's going to be your best bet. It's going to be better than spraying your plants down with oils and things like that, even though oils might work real fast. Now, we could talk about like plant therapy that'll like knock everything down. I think that that's an oil and it's safe and it'll, it'll pass metric testing and stuff. Um, you know, so, you know, there's lots of, lots of products. Uh, I had one more thing that I wanted to say real quick about, about that. And that was um, the aphids and in, in those. Yeah. They're just like the fungus gnats, the root aphids. You won't notice it in your plants. You won't like maybe one day, just like a fungus gnat, you'd be like, ah, oh, I got a little, I got a little fucking fungus gnat on one of your flowers. You know, knock it off. It'll be on your sugar leaf or something. And, and they're e kind of easy to manage. They're not tearing off the, the bottoms of your plants like thrips do. They're not like, um, you know, destroying your leaves and stuff. Like uh, you're, you're not seeing nutrition deficiencies and things like that. But, you know, you can battle them with like high winds. As long as you've got like a lot of good wind speed and stuff like that, they're not going to like get in your buds. You can maintain a healthy garden. Just keep those populations down. I mean, if you think about nature, when plants are growing outside, there's there's bugs. You just have to maintain populations. You just have to make sure that they're not getting in your plants. They're not sticking to your flowers. The the oils on your plants are doing what they're doing, and that's repelling the bugs. And they will. They should naturally be repelled off the buds, and you should have enough wind circulation that you should be okay. And just keep those numbers down. Knock them down. Use use beneficials. Avoid using things like Eagle 20 as a nuclear device. That's all I got to say. Well, <clears throat> you said it twice, so it must be really fucking important. But, uh, yeah, airflow, man. That's another, like, Abash brought it up, too. It's like a physical, it's a physical thing that it's hard for those fuckers to fly around when it's windy, you know? And that's, I think, one of the biggest mistakes I see in a lot of beginning gardens. You know, somebody who's just starting out or whatever, they might have one fan in their whole room. And I'm like, whoa, what are you doing, man? You need, you need to get some airflow in here. You know, I'm not, you know, some people say, yeah, you want to see the leaves rustling and, and, and all of that. I'm not a huge fan of fans blowing, especially in the flower room, blowing directly on my plants. But I do want to stand anywhere in the room and feel a breeze or, or at least some kind of air movement. I don't want stagnant air. I've got a small little flower room that's only three lights. And I have one, two, three, four fans in my, it used to be five. I took one out. I thought it was a little overkill. So I have four fans in that little area, but it's important to have the, especially when we're talking fungus gnats, to have the airflow under the canopy and over the canopy at the same time. Because the over canopy removes your heat and it helps keep your lights cooler so they run more efficient. And then the under canopy stuff uh, keeps that stagnant air down and so that uh, the air moving across the surface of the soil is going to um, make the water evaporate more. And uh, so that top level of your soil isn't going to be wet and, and uh, fungus gnats aren't really going to be attracted to it as much. So just fans could be a huge step. Yeah, guys, that air that's low to the ground, you know, from your knees down, that top two feet of air, that is stagnant, humid, high CO2 enriched air. I mean, you want to stir that stuff up. So, Stir it up to the top. Get a couple fans blowing it up, doing whatever you can. That is dirty air. I agree. On the ground. Yep. And it's oh. and because CO2 is heavier than than air, it's gonna sit at the bottom, like you said. And if you're growing in living soil or you have a big micro presence in your soil, they breathe just like us. So they're gonna be pushing out CO2 also coming out of the soil. Every time you water and you and the water gets sucked down, it pushes everything else out. So here comes more CO2. If you don't have a fan to push that CO2 back up towards your plants, they're, they're missing out on, they could get more bulk from all that carbon. 
I've been thinking about perpetual grow rooms. Like it's a little bit off topic from the pest thing, but maybe we can get into it one day. Like where you have a dual, dual bloom rooms and each bloom room is kind of feeding the other one at, at opposite cycles. So when one room's lights are off, you know, it's off gassing a little extra CO2, pump some of that CO2 into the room that the lights are on and vice versa, you know, let the microbes generate all of your CO2 gases and almost use like a perpetual, you can do the same with heat too. The heat from the lights that are on, pump that into the grow room with the lights are off, always maintain a stable. I mean, it's basically growing with a lung room, right? But like, yeah. it's like a per, you can do these like perpetual so, growth cycles. So like on paper, that sounds fucking amazing, awesome. Now introduce a pest. How awesome is it now? Right. Now it's in my whole fucking garden instead of just contained in that one room. So yeah, it could be really cool, and it could be really shitty. It's kind of like a race car, so or yeah. pottery mildew. I mean, yeah, yeah, or any, yeah, exactly. Pottery yeah. mildew is, yeah, yeah. Man, it's it's so filtered air is real important. It's, it's funny you brought that up because that specific topic right there. I believe me and Spartan actually talked about that in the first season of the the frugal way. Like, we got to figure out the math numbers on this. How to you know <laughs> take care of all the CO two and everything we need just by swapping rooms. But uh. Or have like a specific mushroom room, you know, that generates your CO2 for you, right? Yeah. I think that'd be a cool little uh, episode. But uh, Michigan, or M2, you're a little quiet down here because I know you Sorry, we're stealing the show, man. It's just, we're blabbing. Yeah, I know she hasn't had any pests, right? So, I mean, you're just kind of soaking it in. Like, is it, how how bad is this freaking you out right now? And we haven't even got to the bad ones yet. Yeah, I hope I I never have to deal with some of those bad ones. Unfortunately, I've only had to deal with fungus gnats so far. So I'm using the lockout method with the sand on top right now and the fly traps. And, you know, I got after it right away so that I didn't have an overpopulation. So I'm definitely seeing the numbers dwindle down. So fixing my issues with overwatering is definitely my problem there so the root cause well that's another thing i just thought of is the abolished your fruit way of growing the way that we have the 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 plants actually feeding from the bottom the water's in the bottom and it kind of absorbs up usually the top layer isn't super super wet so that just growing that way may help have you noticed uh differences in fungus net populations growing a different way compared to that way or, or where is about the same yeah that's actually one of the original reasons for the wicking is dealing with gnats because i would i didn't have anything on the top but it's just the fact that my top soil was dry the majority of my grow they just couldn't thrive now would you get issues with them thriving in the um the wicking portion like the bottom portion where like maybe you have hydrogen or or, or the water that stands I, you would think but no because actually mostly probably because that's where my centipedes live and i don't think anybody fucks around in the thunderdome down there but i i before that i didn't see them like colonizing or anything down there the only thing that would be down there is a. Uh, springtails but they're gone now because that's uh centipede's favorite food i barely see them i would also be curious in the summertime have you ever had any issues with mosquitoes with uh with the water that that you hold down uh no not indoors but i imagine outdoors you'd have some issues you'd have to like leave uh mosquito dunks in your waking beds I wonder, I wonder if the I wonder if BB takes care of mosquitoes also. I wonder if that's on the list of them. Oh, just, well, I would just use BTI. Bacillus BTI? Ther, yeah, Bacillus therogensis Israeli, which is what's a mosquito dunk. Is, that's what's in that, too. Is that something you could possibly put in a rain barrel or something or store yeah. in a reservoir? Okay. All right. Yep. And you also have the frugal specialist soap nuts, the only, uh, like, super really – uh, develop like research we have from a university on uh, pest control is actually on mosquitoes for them. They used it on a, a large scale uh, like golf course or whatever to control it down there. And it, it had a unique method of killing the larvae, which uh, a lot of the other control methods that they've used didn't have and they see a lot of potential in it. 
especially for the fact that you can just take like two of them damn nuts, let it emulsify for a while, and you can just sit there and do multiple gallon after gallon after gallon. Yeah, if, uh, I've threw in that, uh, the two that I have in the tent for the frugal build, I've got soap nuts in the res, the water res in my sip containers. When I look down in there, I can see them floating in there. But at this point, uh, let's go ahead and take a break and we'll be right back. Every day, federal scientists are looking for new ways to kill bugs. Your basic arachnid warrior isn't too smart, but you can blow off a limb. And it's still 86% combat effective. Here's a tip. Aim for the nerve stem and put it down for good. Would you like to know more? Everyone's doing their part. Are you? The war effort needs your effort. At work, at home, in your community. <laughs> All right, Jedi and Sith and Grays, of course. We can't forget you. We're PC correct here. Uh, now we are on to the serious best. First, we know we got to go. You know, after a few years, you you won't consider this one a serious, but this is probably the first serious best you'll deal with as a grower, and that is the two-spotted spider mite. Uh, don't always go on the two spots. You can see other variations of the coloring on your leaves. If you see stippling, which are small little circles all over the place, it's a type of spider mite that is attacking your plant. There's other types of mites that are look similar, and even the same size, but they are predators. And one of the key things to tell the difference between the two is speed. Normally in the insect world, or at least with us, uh, insects that are slow are normally going to be pests for us. And insects that are fast are beneficial because you got to be fast to get dinner. And just a few things on uh, the two pot spotted spider mite. Uh, are web forming mites that pierce plant cells and remove their con contents. All spider mites have two body segments and four pairs of legs as adults. Uh, spider mite adults, as the name suggests, have two large dark spots on the back end. But like I said, I don't want you to just go on the spots. It's, that's not always, there's other ones that are bad that don't have the spots. These mites lay round eggs, which hatch in the six-legged larvae. In the subsequent stages, the protonymph and the deutonymph stages are eight-legged as they are as adults. Since the entire life cycle take as little as eight days, spider mites have many generations per year and can rapidly increase in numbers. And they, the way they got me when I was a when I first started growing, like I didn't even notice these guys on the leaves because I wasn't getting close enough. I just started to see canoeing and I was getting into late flower and I was first time I started to see like heavy deficiencies in my plants because I used to keep stuff so green. And uh, I go and zoom in, I get real close to the leaf and I shit you not, spider mite was running around. He ran right up to the tip of the curve where the, the leaf is like curved or whatever. And he looked right at me and he's like, fuck, he noticed us. And after that point, it was a battle. I did all kinds of terrible treatments. Like, I guys, I even sprayed isopropyl alcohol on there to try and take them out. And that is such a terrible idea when you're in flower because you wash all your trichomes away. You're, you're doing an alcohol extraction when you're spraying there, basically. All kinds of bad stuff. And, like, I even, at one point, I couldn't find anything to beat them. And... I had to go back to physical methods, and one of the ways that I beat them was with strong strains like the Death Star to, that I could grow in flower with absolutely zero fan leaves on them. The, the, it would just fatten up nugs on its own. It didn't need fans. And eventually, I ended up getting rid of them that way and using different soaps. But I, I swear to you, I think it's because I had the right strains in there that I could grow long enough and not have leaves for them to eat on, and they just kind of phased themselves out but I don't think I had a product that just took them out. What's your guys' I, experience with them? Yeah, as I say, I've beat them and it was with predators. And um, I, I tried, like you said, I've tried to do the different things. And 
good luck with uh, plant therapy. That that works pretty good too. I found on spider mice, and I use it more thrip wise. Well, actually, I use it for IPM now. I just I'll spray it once a week anyway. But uh, don't want to use it in flour because it's an oil. So why why don't we want to? You know, even if you're the worst person in the world and you don't care about people's health know that the oil on you know thc is soluble in oil so you're spraying oil on your plant where you think your thc is going you know so don't spray in flour or you're going to lower your potency i'm going to get myself a bottle of plant therapy this spring and i'm going to spray all of the ornamentals on my property that way um well when i i guess it's an it's a it it's only when it's active, right? So there has to be an open population or can it be used as like a preventative? I should ask that first. Yeah, you can use it as a preventative. That's that's how I use it. In, in veg, they get sprayed once a week, usually on the weekend. And um, I just do that once a week on the plant, spray them down real good. I spray the pot, I spray the floor, I spray the walls, <laughs> I spray everything. I know that we can, we can bring them in very easily from a grocery store, bumping across, you know, our, our buddy at the, the social club, at, at the local cannabis cup or anything like that. Um, you know, we can also very easily bring them in our house being just outside in our, you know, yard, doing yard work or something. So, you know, I think about that all the time. I definitely have a bush or two that I'm always cutting back because there's a branch that's just loaded up with spider mites and, you know, I'll treat treat it with whatever, but I'll have to, you know, re- I'm going to remove that branch. You know, I'm not even going to worry about spraying it. I'm just going to burn them. So <laughs> that's what I do. So a couple of procedures like to follow with spider mites. I don't want people out there freaking out when they have them. Like say you get them in late stage flower, but you only notice them on some lower buds or something like that. Don't freak out. Have anyone- Keep our composure. We've got too far. There's too much to lose. Keep our composure. Just defoliate everything around them. Get some predator satchels. Put it in there. You can make it to the end of flower and not have an issue. It's it's you want to use with pests like that and ones that aren't big deals. uh, I'd say thrips, spider mites, fungus gnats. You quarantine those and treat those with predators now that seems to be the best uh way to do it nowadays and if those populations get out of control you can't control them with those predators that's when you call them those three pests i don't consider a huge threat anymore and you really if you have the right practices you can control them in any stage i did forget to mention one thing that i've been doing uh, lately and recently for the prevention of of mites and that's, uh, I do sulfur dips. So just buy wettable sulfur at your local hardware store. Don't go to the grow store. You're going to get ripped off. And it's like two tablespoons per gallon of water. You put like this yellow powder. And um, if you have a surfactant, I, the sulfur I bought actually had it already in it. So I didn't have to, you know, add something to make it spread better. But I just will mix up a small little bit of it. And uh store it in a sprayer like i'll maybe do a half gallon store in a a pump sprayer and the only time that pump sprayer ever really gets used is if i see evidence of mites then i'll spray the whole fucking veg but otherwise it's just storing my solution i just mixed up and i pour a little bit out into a solo cup i fill up a solo cup and then when i cut my clone that clone gets a, a whole dip in there and when that clone comes out of the clone dome and gets planted into its first soil it gets dipped again before it even goes into soil. And that goes with clones that I bring in too. So, I mean, those for sure are going to get that sulfur dunk because I, I think a dunk is the, is the best way to apply anything to a plant other than predators, obviously, because you're completely, you're getting complete coverage and you're doing it pretty quick. It's not taking you forever. So I just wanted to give that little tip on the sulfur. It's not expensive and it's a cheap, easy way to do it. Um, if you wanted to, you could spray it probably once every two weeks. You don't even want to need to do like two treatments with it probably and you'd be good. But um, it's going to leave residue on your leaves. It's going to look like powdery mildew. And um, that's why I only do it at the early stages because they grow out of it and you don't really see any of that stuff any 
after that. So it gets two treatments, two dunks of sulfur. And then you have to wait at least two weeks before you ever spray an oil. So two weeks after they, they're, they're planted into the soil, after that two weeks, I can start with the plant therapy once a week until flower. And some of the natural treatments out there for our, our guys that don't want to use any kind of products for spider mites are, of course, predators. Uh, most castiles, like castile soaps, uh, Soap nuts work really well. Uh, Method one PPS, yeah, it's plant protecting protection system. Yeah, that would be amazing for just what's inside it. It's got it'll kill all the different stages of uh, spider mites. It's got the surfactant. It's got the alcohol to kill the the eggs, and it's even got the peppermint oil to work as a preventative. There's been a change. They don't have the alcohol anymore. So oh, they don't. You can add it yourself. I do 30 mils per gallon if I'm looking to do an alcohol. But uh, you can just use ISO. But don't do that in flour again because alcohol dissolves so fucking your trikes too. So Never spray in flour. If there's something that's just going to ruin your harvest, it's time to reset. Like If you have flowers and you're fucking up, it's over. Restart. If it's a major thing, like I said, there's you need to learn how to control it. Most of the time, you'll find that, especially if you run a multi-strain garden, it'll only be like one strain or two strains in the uh, the tent or the room that are getting hit, as they seem to favor either certain turfs or certain strains, or even as much as to say that those uh, those strains are weaker genetic wise because plants see or pests see in infrared like plants are, that are stressing that aren't happy give off signals literally for bugs to come and cold them and bugs are also attracted to green you know the nice green color because they know that's food so what do you do <laughs> yeah i mean if you're going if you're going with the super green you gotta just keep them bricks levels max because supposedly the plants don't even see them then they're just they they get superpowers they go become invisible no! No! i really really want to get into that i need to get a bricks meter i'm curious on all that but uh before we get too far down another rabbit hole let's uh let's jump into thrips because this is actually something that i had to just deal with and I, that's why i ordered the the predators and I actually had to call one of my rooms not because I didn't think the thrips were controllable it's the fact that I have legacy genetics and I don't want to risk any kind of uh, like vector like any kind of viral or pathogen to them so even if one got in there and bit them I'm, I would be worried about that so I just chopped everything froze it and I say kill them all yeah oh yeah, yeah! ordered uh, 15,000 uh, of two different types of predators to put in all the other rooms and make sure everything's okay. But thrips, they're real small, they're minute. These guys really aren't anything like they can get knocked off by a fart. They're slender with uh, frigid wings and, you know, really, really, if you, if you zoom in on them, they look, they look crazy. Let's just put it that way. Different thrip species species feed mostly on plants by puncturing and sucking the contents out. Although a few predators, although a few are predators, though, I didn't know that until I did some research today. Approximately 6,000 species have been discovered. They fly only weakly. Like I said, they have featherly rings. They're, they're nothing. Like, you can blow on them. You use high wind. You can, like, literally, if the plant's small enough, guys, you can shake it and probably knock every thrip you have on it off into the soil. Uh, they don't really fly. They use a, an unusual mechanism called clap and fling. But, uh... Yeah, guys, don't freak out about thrips. They're they're kind of like I would consider in the fungus net territory. They're really not anything hard to deal with. 
But one thing that we haven't talked about yet is how you can tell their throat. At least for me, the easiest way for me to tell if it's a turk one, you can kind of see them, which most mites are really hard to see. And two, the damage that they do, where the, for example, the spider mite, it has just like, it's almost like somebody put pins through your leaf, even though there's not holes there. It looks like it because there's like little yellow or white spots. Where a thrip, it looks like something just scratched the surface of your leaf. It's weird. It's like weird squigglies going down your leaf surface. Looks like a dead worm. Yeah. Yeah. It's just really like beef jerky worm. And it's shiny. Like it's shiny compared to the rest of the leaf too. It really sticks out. So um, a lot of people will say that like a spider, it's hard to tell the difference between a spider mite and the thrip damage to a leaf but i think they look way different oh it's way easier because spider mite is a perfect circle and then like thrip if you say if you have like a good white light room it's a little harder i'd say in hps but with all our new led lights you literally just scan the canopy like just move it around a little bit and you can see the shine from thrip damage you'll know right where they are i had an interesting relationship with thrips for a while they would help me bottom my plants <clears throat> they did a good job at it man they, uh, yeah, they, um, they would help me bottom my plants. So I would definitely defoliate uh, to help, you know, remove them in populations uh, with, you know, taking large scoops out of your, um, your, your media when you're done. Also, because like you said, they're just falling at while you're doing your thing, they're dropping and falling and bouncing and going all over the place. So, you know, collect all of your leaves and get them out of your room. Don't just leave them in your room. And, uh, I know a main source of how I got them in my room before was I have a mulberry tree that hangs over my yard. My neighbor has. And when I would go out there in the spring and early summer and pick mulberries, I noticed one season that um, they were all over the mulberries. So, you know, again, there's another pest coming in from, from outdoors, a very easy one that can probably fit through your window screen or something like that. So. I think that's all. And, and as far as getting rid of them, I had, I mean, this was a long, long, long time ago. And I had the, um, I used oil, oils, um, what are they like lavender oils, uh, rosemary oils, things like that. I want to say I used like uh, Monterey products and uh, I used nuclear uh, tactics at the time. Uneducated. You're going to have to talk uh, Mrs. Redden and letting you have one of those sanitation pad like walk through things like they have at uh, Mint Canico. I'm going to get Miss C to let us tell that in a new place. So <clears throat> speaking of that, what I like to do, all right, so I like to put, uh, so this is something that I knew that I started doing in the last couple of years while I've been learning permaculture. And so I'm planting uh, rosemary, lavender, thyme. I'm planting different beneficial plants on my property that will hopefully like repel a lot of these pests away from my property and away from, you know, the entrance points and things like that. So I'm kind of starting small and trying to work with a little bit of permaculture design and things like that. I'm trying to put some of these things, you know, close to my doors and um, <clears throat> entrance points and things like that. Uh, citronella and stuff like that keep other bugs away you know there's there's certain things we can do in the summertime but, oh that's that's all very important like i mean if like i said we're the vectors that are bringing in all the problems into our garden normally you know if we're if we get it from seed and say we start from scratch and we didn't have no problems in the soil or whatever that we built we're the ones that cause the issues in our gardens and little things like that could save our butt. Yeah, no, we didn't really want anybody to videotape outside of the facility just for security reasons. But uh, I don't know if you happen to notice, but around our building, it's surrounded by, I don't know how many feet of rock. You don't see grass. You don't see, <laughs> you know, big trees hanging over around our building. You don't see any of that shit. It's fucking like, you know, at work, they're, we're serious about it. So, um, you know, you that's like the extreme you could go to, like, fuck this yard. <laughs> I'm not going to fucking ruin my crop uh, kind of a thing. So, you know, you can get as extreme as you want to get. And uh, it's still something pretty simple to do, you know, and it uh, could pay in dividends and what you save by not getting a certain pest. Yeah, they got it easy down in like Arizona and Florida and all those like New Mexico and stuff for all their yards are like volcanic rock and pebble stone and stuff. 
Man, don't even get me started on yards. I'm I'm all for that. Like cover everything in damn rocks. Lawns are such a waste of space and water. Like if we're not growing food on them, we do not need them. Rock See, gardens look way cooler, anyways. I like rock gardens. I say grow grow tomatoes, grow berries. Except mulberries, because they're putting thrips in your damn garden. Yeah, I have a mulberry tree. When you said mulberry and you said thrips, I'm like, oh, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so do the test. The way that I like to test it in the summer, early summer when I know that they're in the season is I'll, I'll do a handful of fresh mulberries and I'll fill it with water. And if I see a whole bunch of thrips starting to pop out and float around, I'm like, ah, fucking A. You got to wash them off. And then oh, oh, fuck. <laughs> or you get a little bit of thrip protein. Oh, yeah, you're definitely getting thrip protein if you're eating them. <laughs> yeah, I might be cutting that motherfucker down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no berries worth it. No, 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 because they plagued me for a good year and a half, and I had no idea I had them until probably the last half a year. And that is the hemp russet mite. That is is a type of it's a type of microscopic arthropod that feeds on leaves, new growth, flower buds, and granular trichomes of the cannabis plant. Symptoms of hemp russet mite damage can be confused, like I said, with nutrient deficiencies, viruses, and even like uh physiological like uh disorders you know plants just growing weird like i had bud sites on the og that were just like they would look like this and just knuckle up it was just crazy looking stuff like i've never seen it before and uh hemp russet mites they like to feed on the surface layer of plant cells piercing them with their minute mouth parts and feeding on the cell fluids no visible symptoms are produced when uh Russet mites are in low populations. You won't even notice you have them. But a range of symptoms do develop during an outbreak, like we were stating above. And a slight upward curling of the leaves, it's a, not a heat stress taco. It's a little more, uh, I like to say, a, a flaccid taco. A heat stress taco is your leaves still, you know, nice, thick, and turgid. You know, the, the rest of my taco is flaccid. And, uh, it, it's pretty easy to, to point out uh, another symptom, like once they're really, really bad is where they get their name is actually rusting of new growth. That's why I freaked out in the frugal chat when uh, what's, uh, I think it was, yeah, was Osgro 420, shout out to him, shared us that picture. I was like, oh, no. But luckily, it just ended up being uh, some kind of deficiency or something. I think you just had to let it dry out. But uh you guys ever had to deal with russets because i mean that it's the darkest times in my gardening career thank god no i haven't but uh what'd you do to treat them if they're in veg i i would do a fucking sulfur i would sulfur the fuck out of them that's what i would do but I don't that, know. that's the thing is nothing really like kills them because no matter what you do like yeah you might see some reductions but there's always one of them that survive because they can they can overwinter for a very long time they are the uh, adult female i'm not sure if they're they have two sexes but i know the adult can burrow into the actual stem of your plant lay an egg wait for your uh your IPM or whatever that is to wear off and then it will hatch and come back out and start all over again. You, it's, it's pretty bad. I got, I got lucky to beat them. And the only reason I say I beat them is because I made it out of there with the OG. I lost everything else like cuts to until recently, I didn't even know that they were still around because it was actually mislabeled. Like the, it's the OB ripper from uh, gauge green uh, group here in Michigan is just absolute fire. It's vanilla and grape, uh, vanilla wafers and grape. And it's super, super frosty, heavy yielder. I, I'm, I haven't bought a pack of seeds and I'll be buying that one here soon. Uh, 
but anyways yeah i lost tons of stuff on it and the way i beat it with the og was doing dunks like sulf or like uh spartan was saying and not and going beyond just dunking the top of it i literally took the baby og and i went in there with my hands uprooted i just said fuck it man it, it, you're gonna survive you're gonna survive pulled it out went in there with a luke uh lukewarm bucket of water and just dunked the roots in there for a while until all the soil came off completely and then i treated it with uh it was it was it was a castor oil and whatever natural mix i i gonna have to re-look up and post it here you know when we do the edit i can't remember the name but it the product was recommended to me from a guy that still works at htg taylor and uh he recommended that to me and it's a cast it's some kind of castor oil mix and that's what i dunked it in the roots and the top part of the the plant and that's what ended up getting rid of it on the og but everything else i ended up calling out of the garden because i just that was the only thing that i was going to try to save it sucks man i had so many good things because at that at, i just gotten done like apprenticing under uh a really really good old school grower that handed me all those really good cuts like that i had the holy grail i had all kinds of really good ones man that i just i probably won't get back because people don't give those up yeah but i figured between all of us we're gonna have some fire here it's no big deal if any one of us runs into some issues fucking cut that shit we got you that's really the benefit i mean i i say it a lot and i'm I, and i'll continue saying it you know, it's it's legal now for us, so we can be free with our cuts with our friends. We don't have to worry about getting caught if we're going to be carrying plants around our, outside our house. It's to your benefit. If you have some fire, don't think that, oh, I need to hoard this because... I want to be the only one with this. Fuck that. Give it to like your trusted friends. I'm not saying to spread it around to everybody. Tell them McCluskey. Tell them what time it is. But have like we have like you know a great circle of great growers, and what we can do collectively is far more than what we can do on our own. Trying to sift through cuts on our own, you know what I mean, and seeds on our own. So if everyone just sifts through what they have and they pick out their keepers and we trade them all, then it doesn't matter what happens if, if uh, your house burns down, you just hit up your buddies in the circle and you collect all your plants back. It's fucking amazing. Yeah, I mean, you guys don't know how much that means to me to know that my OG's backed up in like all your gardens, you know. It seriously, it's so much. If I feel so much security, and I'm not worried about ever losing it now. I get rusted, it's, it's gone. I'm just be hitting on my friends to get the cut back. I mean, if we're having huge pest outbreaks and things like that, we're probably running the wrong genetics to begin with. I mean. <clears throat> Genetics is such a healthy genetics, good, healthy genetics. You shouldn't really be having huge outbreaks. I mean, you know, soil, soil stuff happens. We're always going to have like be dealing with gnats and stuff like that. It's, we're always going to be accidentally overwatering or stuff. And hydro, I mean, I water every single day. That's just something that I'm always going to be dealing with. You know, there's just, it's always something I'm going to have to preventive, preventatively try to keep them out of my, my root zone. Right. But like, if we got stuff that's like eating our plants and stuff like that, we don't have enough like terpene power in our plants to repel these things away for the most part. We should probably be dominating our genetic pool with some better stuff, right? So yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, if we got a chop because we keep getting rusted, all this stuff keeps happening, like let's get rid of it. Let's move on to something that's a little sturdier, a little stronger, something else that maybe can repel against r rusted mites when that they come or we have those outbreaks and stuff you know because those genetics have to be out there that's good you brought that up because I, I wouldn't even thought to talk about that tonight but that is like in the data from my recent outbreak 
genetics do matter because other than just the one tent right there that had the infestation on the couple bottom buds i found it in on one in here the citral glue and everybody else in there was resistant they didn't have any any kind of damage or even one thrip on them and then my leg my tent with my uh my keeper genetics that are in flower right now the the OG, the skunk, and the sour melon, they didn't have any signs either. So, that I mean, there's something to be said about genetics. And I've seen it in friends' grow, uh, grow rooms recently with stuff like PM. I, I don't want to call anybody out, but I'll say what strain was resistant to that PM, and that was uh, Delato. It was in the middle of a bunch of strains that had PM, and it didn't have one sign of PM on it. So shout out to the Delato strain. Yeah, man, I think I talked a little bit on our last bro show episode uh, 28, maybe that was about um, how I kind of test and experiment with uh, planting vegetables next to cannabis in the garden and expecting powdery mildew on those certain vegetables like zucchinis and things like that. It's almost impossible to keep powdery mildew off of certain squash. So, I like to experiment by co-planting banker plants, man. Like, like I was talking about that mulberry tree, right? I'm a couple hundred feet from my cannabis garden outdoors. I didn't have any thrift issues on my cannabis, have healthy cannabis plants, a healthy, you know, root zone, a healthy, you know, you got a lot of other predators going on in your garden. Those thrips probably couldn't even make it from that tree to my cannabis garden because whatever else was out there, dragonflies or whatever else was just taking them out, you know? That's a great tip for everything, but I want, but the PM, I want you to remember that. Sorry, uh, I drifted off. Man. <laughs> yeah, the, there's millions of types of uh, strains of PM out there, and there's only two that can attack the cannabis plant. So using decoy plants for testing on that specifically, but pests and stuff, other stuff like that, that's great. That's a good point. So I might be doing a terrible science project. I'm only testing PM. And then, and then right here is where the more you know pops up. <laughs> but uh, other than the russets, the last one and the really bad one that people like to refer to as the Borg because resistance is futile. We are the Borg. Lower your shields and surrender your ships. We will add your biological and technological distinctiveness to our own. Your culture will adapt to service us. Resistance is futile. Because most of the time when you get these guys, they're from a uh, bigger, like, grow, like, commercial style, where they've been treated with uh, all the stuff in the book, and they've gained resistance from them. So these guys really tend to be super bugs. You get broad mites called everything burning with fire uh these bugs are so small that even like our cheap little microscopes that we all got from amazon can have a hard time seeing them uh if you can get close enough they have six legs when they're young they have eight legs as adults symptoms are often uh, confused with heat stress overwatering, ph imbalance and root problems uh it's pretty easy to but one of the signs the new the new growth will always look like curled, tore up, and have like a wet grease look to it. It's a really good common sign of it. And uh broad mites, they don't attack they the bastards don't even attack the plant like even they, they go all over the place and they just they just bite it in different spots. So you never really it's hard to get a concentration and know that you have them until it's too late. It's another thing that sucks about them. And if you get them in flower, you're you're done. Like you you're not yeah, I would say even in early flower, you're not gonna be able to beat them because even if there's only a few left, they're gonna go up there and go after your fresh bud sites first and instantly, you know, they're gonna dry up from disease or whatever. Like that's just a reset pass from my point of view. Yeah, the reset pass is very important to know. The, um, you know, what's also real, you said it real important was the resistance that they build to the, um, whatever defense mechanism you might be using or IPM you might be using. 
it's it's really important. It doesn't matter what pest that we're talking about on this show. Like, um, we could we could be talking about all kinds. We could be talking about ants bringing in um, aphids and all kinds of stuff. And like we were talking about hitchhikers and things like that, which uh, might even be another crazy thing to get into if, we, if you want to. But um, <clears throat> like keeping your IPM consistent, like making sure that you're having the right dosage for the right pest and all of that stuff, because these pests do build resistances to these um, chemicals, whether they're oils or whatever. If you're not using the um, BB on a consistent basis, and I'm not saying that something's going to build a resistance to the BB, but if you're not applying it regularly and you fall out of tune and there just so happened to be a larva of, a, of an aphid or something in there, guess what? It's already pregnant. You already probably got a, a couple dozen or a hundred thousand more to deal with, you know? So always be consistent with your IPMs and stay on it. Don't just slack off for a month or six weeks or something because you haven't seen a pest. They're, they're there. They're in your soil and you just hadn't, they're just not big enough for you to see yet. So take them out. Keep them, keep them out is what I mean. Uh, and we we got a couple minutes left here and i actually wanted to go around and i wanted you guys all to give like uh final words of wisdom like you just did right there red uh and you know any kind of shout outs and sign offs that you had for the night so was there anything else that you wanted to add on to that that awesome closing statement there and shout outs yeah i guess that would pretty much be my main my main closing statement is to just you know stay consistent with your ipm and and identify the correct pest um i think that those are a couple of the, the main important things um also just be clean going into your grow room you know don't uh do outdoor garden work and then bounce around and go water your plants inside you know change your clothes if you're able to take a shower or something like that and then go do your garden work or do your garden work what i do is i do my garden work in the, in the morning and then i go out and i do my outdoor garden stuff but anyway i'm red setter farm i want to thank all you guys here at the frugal force and i also want to thank uh everybody in the michigan bros grow show thanks everybody i don't want to eat up any more time it's only a couple more minutes Peace. spartan grown my fellow jedi warrior any words of uh great wisdom for the fellow padawans out there yeah i think the only thing we missed is crop scouting you got to look for these things to be able to treat them the sooner you find them the better off you are so make sure you're always taking a look at, at your leaves after you're, you're, you're in the watering anyway. Take a look. And good luck to M2 to find anything else after that. I think we covered everything. <laughs> what about you, M2? Any words of wisdom? Um, yeah, I think that the only thing, I mean, you guys covered it, but being preventative I think is very important. And just as soon as you identify the problem, doing something about it. Michigan medicated. Did uh did you guys have anybody you wanted to shout out, Red or Spartan? I don't know if you uh you got to do that or not now you're good. And what about you, Red? Yeah, all my homies over in the Helios crew, they're um getting some dispensaries opened up on the west side of the state. I think that they're looking to stock shelves and get some things going. And I'm really excited because it's uh it, they're all people from Michigan, so it's really cool. It's not a out of state business coming in doing things, opening up a bunch of shops, which is awesome, man. Cheers, guys! All you guys here on the Frugal Forest, all my awesome homies on the Michigan Bros Grow Show. Cheers to the 2020 grow off and everything, man. Awesome. And uh, I guess some of my final words of wisdom for you guys out there would be to take what you learn here tonight, if this is new information for you and make a SOP for every pest. Just be ready to go with what you want to do and also get some preventative going. You need to have a regular rotation. Uh, an ounce of prevention is worth whatever. I'm sure I destroyed it, but you guys know the same. Uh, and on that note, may the frugal force be with you. Scientists are working around the clock to probe its secrets. Once we understand the bug, we will defeat it. We have the ships. We have the weapons. We need soldiers.
Oh. I hate goodbyes. <laughs> Scientists are working around the clock to probe its secrets. Once we understand the bug, we will defeat it.